UFTV is your university and community TV station. Can you hear me? Last night, you know, we had... Did we mic you up again? Great, okay. So, you know, last night we couldn't hear so well. So, since everybody is almost the same group as we had last night, we're going to, you know, do the introductions at a much shorter clip. Just turn your cell phones off. The bathrooms are all around. If you go out the doors, come back in in the back if you can. Today, um, we have to get her out the door to get her flight. So there will be no time to chit chat afterwards. So if you come up, try to come up and chit chat with her, the faculty will block you because we have to get her out the door to her to, so she can make her flight home. She travels quite a bit. So, and she's been very, very busy lately. So we do want her to get home. So we will move right now and get going. So welcome Dr. Wendy Hildebrand. everybody. I'm glad she reminded us all to turn off our phones because that would have been interesting up here now, wouldn't it? Uh, so, happy Friday morning. I've got to turn this mic on because you won't be able to hear back there, right? Okay. Happy Valentine's Day indeed. I know. Did anybody have a happy Galentine's Day event yesterday? Yeah? I hope so. Oh, with me. <laughs> well, that's funny. Uh, and did, did uh, any of the fellas, have, what was the day they were trying to uh, get started on? I, I saw someone saying they wanted to have a happy uh, Palin's time, <coughs> Palentine's Day. And I thought, they might need to work on that one. <laughs> that's just too hard to say all the way around. But anyway, can you hear me back there? Is this working or do I need to shift it? Then we need to shift it, don't we? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. So let's see here what we can do. Is that a little better? Any better? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's good to see you all on this fine Friday morning. You know, that's a little bit of a travel issue too is the orientation, like what day is it? So uh, they were talking about uh, some, of you, some of the students had class this morning. I was like, but it's Saturday. And uh, it's not Saturday today. So, But I was going to say, then I, then I was reminded that it doesn't matter. So you weekenders, <laughs> you're just uh, out of luck. So uh, anyway, so uh, I'm glad, glad to see you all. I'm also laughing at the back row. Hello, back row people. Indeed. Oh, I know, but why would you sit up front when you've got perfectly good seats in the back row? <laughs> exactly, surrounded by friends, and if you can hear, then you're, you're all good. So, uh, as always, my favorite place in class, I was one of those back row girls, so I completely understand um, how that goes. A little ironic then that here I am. So, um, I do uh, look forward to talking with you all um, this morning about something that is um, uh, particularly, I don't know, just matters a good deal to me. It's, uh, I was talking with you yesterday, uh, you know, about role conflict. We had that discussion. If you were here yesterday, if you weren't, this is going to be like, what's she talking about? But uh, just roll with me for a short minute. Um, but we talked about role conflict. We also talked about clinician well-being and resilience and that being a priority for uh, the AOTA Board of Directors. Um, and so it's um, exciting to me to also be able to talk with you uh, about uh, another priority uh, for our board of directors. And I say that um, knowing that it's not just people in that room that are AOTA, first of all, and it's not just people in that room that are uh, interested in population health. So uh, we have an opportunity though to to talk about population health, to make plans to do something in the population health kind of arena, and really think about this as an opportunity to respond to uh, some of those drivers of change that were kind of uh, on the screen yesterday. Um, when I put up that drivers of change, um, you know, kind of list yesterday, 
uh, if, you, if you noticed or if you heard, um, as I was going through some of those, population health uh, was listed as one of those drivers of change. There's a lot going on out there, a lot of conversations, a lot of initiatives that are trying to get legs, uh, and a lot of that equates to opportunities perhaps for us if we can uh, you know, kind of do this little mind shift um, to help us think about that as a complementary way for us to think about practice, not a replacement or substitute for the things that you know and love every day right now, uh, but as a way for us to maybe frame uh, our approaches uh, that gives us a, a broader opportunity um, to affect the lives of people we serve. So we're going to go down this path. You guys have had uh, opportunities either in class or in your own professional preparation and continuing ed kind of things you've been doing perhaps to, to think about population health, yes or no? Yes, OK. So yeah, def oh, the faculty's like, they better say yes. Uh, I, I know that thing. Yeah, they're looking. Um, but um, I guess I just want to also uh, ask then, is it something that's, that's easy for you to get your head around? Or is it something where you're like, we need to keep talking about it? This is an audience participation moment. <laughs> you can yell. Thank you. <laughs> I think that it's, uh, it's easier for me to think about population health because I actually don't know that many occupational therapists in real life, so it's very tangible for me. Whereas I feel like if you're in a very traditional OT uh, practice area, it's really hard to see how you could extend outside of that practice area or where OT fits in with a um, you know, like the interdisciplinary team that typically works on this kind of thing. Well, mm -hmm. really we're the ones that know the drivers of change for health. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I wish you could hear what she said, because she said it very well. Um, I know, so she was paying attention, if you guys were concerned about that at all. Uh, you know, but I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and so you keep me on point over this next hour to make sure that those things come out of my mouth as we talk um, as well, okay? All right, so that, that's your job today is to watch, to watch me and make sure I get it done. So um, I just, I asked that question because um, social media is a wonderful place. Y'all love social media? How many of you have spent your allotted, you know, daytime, uh, you know, with Facebook or, or on Twitter or wherever you go and get your feed um, every day, right? Uh, so social media is a wonderful place. It's also a very interesting place. Um, I, I check out social media from time to time. I like my own personal stuff, but I also pay attention to the stuff that's out there on different, on different professional sites. And when I say professional sites, I'm talking about those things, uh, you know, related to or uh, you know, generated by uh, folks in our occupational therapy community. And I can tell you that one of the things that um, <coughs> that came across a particular uh, social media site was, was a hefty debate, a passionate debate about population health. And in that debate, it was uh, folks saying, we don't, we don't, but we don't do that. That's not us. That's outside of our scope and many things being said. Um, until someone uh, then started the ball on the other side, but wait. I disagree. I have another view. I believe we do this. We do engage in population health uh, related activities. We do have a place to uh, be present in the population health arena. And here's an example, and here's an example, and here's an example. So I mean, that's all fine and good. But the thing that, uh, that kind of lit my fire just a hair um, and gave me just a little more commitment um, to educate and try to help us all kind of understand this a bit uh, was the post then that said, um, this is the most poorly thought out, half-cocked idea AOTA has ever come through with. Hmm, really? So, you know, you have opportunities to pick your response, right? <laughs> when those kind of things come across 
your, your screen. And I've chosen for my response to be that that means that we need to continue to educate, we need to continue to provide space for this conversation, and we need to make it a priority that is able to generate support of our occupational therapy community and AOTA so that we can make this thing uh, not be quite so poorly thought out or half cocked. So that's my journey. And so I hope that you guys will ride it with me for the next hour and 15 or so, uh, so that we can leave some time at the end um, for questions, okay? All right, I gotta see if I have my like dual computer thing coordinated here. First of all, um, when I think about population health, I think about Ann Wilcock. And um, if you are not familiar with her, um, you probably might want to be familiar with her. She has a, a very uh, solid way, not half cocked, not poorly thought out, very clear way of thinking about population health. And I share this with you. Um, interestingly enough, I was in California in the fall um, talking with folks out there about population health during the week when she passed away. And um, she has very deep roots in California as well, in occupational, the occupational science community. So it was a, a difficult time for folks there. For me, uh, you know, that was the universe talking to me, saying, you're on the right track, girl, so uh, keep talking. And so I share this with you um, because this is how she talks about health. This is how she talks about doing and being and becoming, which has a very population health uh, vein to it. I mean, she's all about that. And how do we let individuals, groups, populations uh, really have the full experience of, of occupation in their daily life? Okay? So I know y'all in the back have, have short eyes today. And so, uh, so she says, I love being an occupational therapist, but I would like our profession to not only work with people with stroke hand injury, schizophrenia, developmental delay, or cerebral palsy, for example, but also with those suffering from disorders of our time, such as occupational deprivation, occupational alienation, occupational imbalance, and occupational injustice. Okay, so that's a big statement. But I think she is talking about that place where sometimes we get kind of hung up in this conversation right out of the get-go is, you know, so who do I work with? Okay, and I would just kind of go out on a limb and say, you don't work with diagnoses anyway. You work with people. We work with people. And so whether that's about individuals, whether it's about groups, whether it's about populations uh, in community, uh, the people we work with that are impacted by, you know, these particular, uh, you know, charges that she puts before us, I think that might be a way for us to maybe get our head around some of what we're going to talk about today, okay? She provides a, a, a frame for us to think about population health. Um, you know, people are, you know, have conversations about, you know, what does occupational therapy bring in a place that works on population health? Um, and it's kind of like many things. You know, people used to ask that about mental health. What do you do in a, what do you do when you're working with people with mental illness? What do you do? And it's like you help people figure out occupation. You help people figure out things meaningful to them. You help people focus on how to be the healthiest they can be uh, in the body and the life that they are, right? So she talks about this and and it helps me kind of understand it, get my head around it. Uh, as a relation, she talks about the relationship between health and occupation in her work. She showcases the underlying occupational determinants of health, the things that either support health and occupation or the things that get in the way. Okay? And she uses occupational science as a ther occupational therapy framework for population health. So she is using that to help us think about how we might intersect with population health through a lens of wellness. Uh, through a commitment to the community uh, by taking a step into that sometimes challenging conversation and arena of occupational justice 
Okay? And also consider ecological sustainability. Okay? And that interconnectedness of all of us uh, in things around us. So um, what a provocative lady. Those are things that, uh, you know, easy to say, yeah, I get that. And then you have a conversation and it's like, ooh, accept that part. Okay? So we have a chance to think about that maybe a little bit differently. All right? Nobody's offended yet, are they? That's a good thing. Okay. So um, I just, I, I'm thinking about this as not something new to us, but something that definitely has um, a future focus to us in terms of positioning us well in the changing uh, healthcare market and in just changing society as a whole. Um, so I want us to take a few minutes and think about uh, current trends uh, in healthcare uh, and as a way for us to uh, really be clear about um, how necessary it is for us to wake up and be present in these conversations. We talked a little bit uh, yesterday about you know, shifts in healthcare, uh, the value-based services kinds of things, going from volume to value, right? I mean, while that's a CMS policy, and it certainly uh, is, and has you know, an impact on folks in many ways that we talked about yesterday, uh, you know, the other side to that is um, while we have a lot of shifting going on over here, we also have shifting happening in other places. And we could spend some time thinking about how that might be an opportunity for us to kind of turn our eyes in some way, uh, not in full, but in part, to think about what are the opportunities perhaps in other places. And this may be being one of those, giving us a chance to think a little bit differently about our healthcare system. Uh, so um, the, there is you know, big growth in our accountable care organizations. Um, we are looking at bundled payment initiatives. We are looking at other performance-based payment arrangements. Um, that's a thing. Adopting population health approaches. Okay, that's listed as part of what's going on in that shift in healthcare. And then also looking at cross-continuum collaboration, that whole continuum of care, uh, trying to do a better job of not being siloed in a lot of the work that we do, which you know, not only limits you know, the opportunities we have to really have the most effect, uh, but it also you know, kind of makes some pretty artificial divides between, ooh, people have a life in the acute care setting and then, oh wait, people have a life <laughs> at home. Um, you know, individuals have things going on. Oh wait, they're part of a population. What's the bigger effect here? What's the bigger issue? And so the notion of looking at things across a continuum is appealing to me and, and, and makes sense. So I hope maybe it's something that makes a little sense to you. Our healthcare system as a whole and it's in the first time we've had to like think about it changing, right? Um, if we think about, you know, the not too long ago up here, we've got a first era like a yesterday kind of healthcare system. We've got a second era like now kind of healthcare system. And then a third era, which we are looking at tomorrow, what's going on uh, through a future kind of lens, right? And what you see up here is just coming out of UCLA. Um, identifying that, you know, I mean, if we think about yesterday, we think about times gone by, right? Very focused on acute and infectious disease kinds of management, germ theory, short-term, you know, stays, uh, or short-term frames, or time frames, medical care, insurance-based funding, industrial models, and reducing death. Reducing death was the, you know, if we can keep people alive, if we can extend that, you know, that time of their life, uh, we have a thing. In that second era then, today, a lot of focus on chronic disease management, right? Uh, multiple risk factors, acknowledging that there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of things that impact health, a lot of things that impact healthcare outcomes. Uh, longer time frames, chronic disease management and prevention, or prevention, prepaid benefits, corporate models, and reducing the onset of disability, 
Okay, so how can we support people, you know, where they're at in a way that not only extends their life, but extends the days of meaningful, satisfactory participation in life, um, reducing that onset of disability. And then on a tomorrow kind of thing, that third era, increasing the focus on achieving optimal health. Health is a priority these days, right? That, I mean, people are paying attention. Doesn't mean we're doing it well all the time, but it's a priority. Uh, complex systems and life course pathways, paying attention to that. Um, generational things, there's different expectations, there's different needs. That plays into changes in our healthcare system. Uh, and my, investing in population-based intervention, okay? Intervention and prevention as a whole. So that population-based, population health thing coming in again. Network models and producing optimal health for all, okay? Even some of that language makes us have to think differently, okay? I mean, if we're, we're all focused on people living their best life, that, that I know. But if we're coming at it from a place where the goal is keep them alive, or if the goal is to support them living, those are two different things. They're different things, and they give us an opportunity to think about a whole lot of things differently. All right? So I'm challenging us to do that. Um, other people are doing that. Obviously, I just showed you a couple of things where they're acknowledging there's a shift over time, right? And like right now time. Uh, the International Classification of Functioning, this is language that guides the World Health Organization. It's incorporated in our occupational therapy practice framework. You know, I mean, this is, this is like base language um, for a lot of documents, a lot of initiatives, a lot of funding, you know, if you think about that too. Um, but I put that there um, just to showcase Participation, activities, body functions and structures, does that sound familiar to you? It probably should, right? I mean, that framework is your best friend right now. A lot of that language that intersects with our framework. And so, um, you know, these are people in big places talking about this, and we are making the connection and need to continue to do more work in that area, okay? All right. The World Health Organization, then, all about this. They are, um, you know, taking great strides to make sure that, you know, people have information, people are getting what they need to be thinking about health for all uh, and to be thinking about how do we serve the needs of populations. Um, I like the part where they also are looking at this through a lens of people-centered care, okay? We were having a great conversation um, some students, where are you at? Uh, we were talking about um, the great work that's happening here in the community. Where's Miranda? I see, oh, she's sitting in front of me, see? Can't run away. And so we're talking about the great work that happens in the community, um, but the conversation that we had was about are they patients or are they people? Because just because we are coming into those places, perhaps in a medical model head, that doesn't mean that they're living their life as recipients of healthcare services. You know? If you have people that are out there, I think about people in, you know, where, I, where I'm at in Kansas City, we have uh, a lot of those community classroom opportunities too, which is a wonderful model. Um, and you know, so we have folks at the American Stroke Foundation, our students, and those are survivors. And they'd get really cranky if we were coming in there calling them patients, because that's not who they see themselves as, as people, as a person, as an individual, at this point in life, two years post-stroke. That's not their identifier, okay? So I really, I, I say that because it's one of those kind of language shifts, you know, focus on death, focus on living. Hmm, okay, there's a change. Uh, how do we reference, um, you know, people that we work with? 
is that about us needing to make a shift or, or are we needing to help other people make a shift? Um, you know, what's the thing? So I'm saying that within this slide because they're talking about people-centered care. And even in a medical environment, they might be patients, but we can't ever lose sight of the part where they are people first and people came before uh, they ever had that traumatic brain injury and there'll be people uh, when they leave and try to pick up pieces, okay? So, uh, what is people-centered care? It says up here, I love this definition, see if it sounds like occupational therapy should have written this one, okay? So, a future in which all people have equal access to quality health services that are co-produced in a way that meets their life course needs and respects social preferences, are coordinated across the continuum of care, and are comprehensive, safe, effective, timely, efficient, and acceptable. And all carers, all of us, all carers are motivated, skilled, and operate in a supportive environment. Okay? If you think about that with what we talked about yesterday, right? It's, it's challenging us to think about health for all people in a big way. It's also uh, making sure that we recognize that health need for us to be able to be skilled, bring our best to work, and be able to do that in an environment that supports us and the work that we do uh, in a way that's optimal health for carers. So uh, I think that's an important definition, perhaps, to think about. Okay. This is just one model for thinking about it that comes out of the, you know, the World Health Organization as well. Um, that person-centered piece, smack in the middle, right where they should be, right? So, so that's an easy one. But boy, there's tight circles around there that we can't discount. Family, community, right? And then you see there, all of that surrounded by universal, equitable, people-centered, and integrated health services. I mean, this is a hope, a model for integrated person-centered health service delivery, okay? Now, all those things are surrounded by a system that supports uh, engagement and health services, okay? So you've got, you know, different service delivery practices, uh, health sector kinds of things over here, whether it's about money, whether it's about, you know, the, the systems themselves. Uh, and then you've also got other sectors, those other things being what I would call uh, some of our context or environment kinds of pieces, social determinants of health, uh, things along that line. So that too uh, is an important part of this whole like head shift. Okay. They identify some strategies that we might want to think about. They're not new, but they frame it in a way that helps us think about you know person-centered care, people-centered health services. Okay. Strategies asking us to be part of uh, supporting the empowerment and engagement of people, okay? Being able to look at our governance, strengthening our governance and incre increasing the accountability. Uh, if that's a part of our healthcare system, are we holding them accountable? Are we voting? Things like that, okay? Having conversations. Reorientation of the model of care. I mean, even a shift from a medical model to a social model, and keep in mind, this is not a political thing, okay? I'm not saying a socialism model, so don't be confused by my words. A social model of health, one that is looking outside of the medical model of health, okay, and health care. Those are different things. The emphasis is different, the conversation's different, and the outcomes uh, might be different as well. Coordinating services within and across sectors, and all of those pieces coming together to create an enabling environment that supports, supports health for people we serve uh, and for us as well. So the World Health Organization, of course, anytime people say, well, what's a good definition of health, all right? There's always, you know, like the classic reference to early definition by the World Health Organization, looking at the state of physical, uh, mental, and social well-being and not just the absence of disease or infirmity. And so, I'll, I guess I have to change that for you, don't I? It's perfect on my screen, but it just didn't make it up there. Um, so anyway, so 
you know, the classic definition is that, that very first one. That was, you know, back in the 1940s. They extended that, which is a good thing. The ability to realize aspirations, to satisfy needs, and to change or cope with the environment. Okay? Now think about, you know, these, these parts, right? Health is therefore seen as a resource for everyday life. You gotta love that, right? A resource for everyday life, a positive concept emphasizing social and personal resources as well as physical capacities. I mean, those, those are things we want to support. Those are things we want to connect with. We want to be part of active solutions with people as they're working out, you know, how to live their best life, right? That's, that's health. That's how they're talking about health. But I love the part where health is seen as a resource for everyday life. Someday, there'll be conversation among some folks in here about retirement, okay? And a lot of times, you know, you ask people, what do you, you, know, what do you want to do in retirement? Or what's going to be the most important thing? Well, I can't retire until I have enough money. Or I can't retire until I meet this particular career objective. Or I can't retire until whatever, whatever. It's like, what do you want to do in your retirement? You know, many times their response is something along the lines of, I really don't have, you know, some big plans. But I'm looking forward to doing what I want to do with an optimal state of health. I, I want to retire early enough, <laughs> healthy enough, that I can do the things I want to do. If I want to do that big climb, I want to be able to do that. You know, if, if I want to be able to have more time with my grandkids, I want to be healthy enough to enjoy that, okay? It is a resource for everyday living. And then as occupational therapists, we're wanting to make sure that's a resource for meaningful everyday living, okay? So, health is created and lived by people within the settings of their everyday life, okay? And this, is, this is that same that same conversation they were having then about health. Created and lived by people within the settings of their everyday life where they learn, work, play, and love. Health is created by caring for oneself and others, by being able to take decisions and have control over one's life circumstances, and by ensuring that the society one lives in creates conditions that allow the attainment of health by all its members. Okay? This is a World Health Organization, an Ottawa Charter definition. Now, you can, you know, we can talk about pieces. We can, you know, which part do we keep? Which part do we throw back? I, you know, for me, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good, good definition. But it also does point out some places where we have some responsibilities, perhaps, or where we have opportunities, perhaps, uh, to have a bigger impact as an occupational therapy profession that maybe we have not, you know, taken full advantage of at this time, okay? So if you think about that, golly, the first three lines, occupational therapy, bam, it's right there. And the end of that, ensuring society creates conditions that support health for all, that seems like not a bad idea either, okay? In order to really get your head around some of that, and in particular, kind of that last part, I put this up here for you to think about. Because that same um, gathering of folks that did some pretty intense study about health also identified what they considered to be health conditions. Okay? So I put this up here uh, just as a reminder of how big this health thing is, where the opportunities might be, and also where some of the challenges in conversation come from, okay? I think, you know, people say, we should be committed to health. Yeah, we should be committed to health. That's an easy one. Everybody wants to be healthy. We want to be committed to health. Until you start really, you know, figuring out all the things that impact health, social determinants of health, all those kinds of things, and that that might take a different kind of work, um, you know, sometimes that gets in our way. So the health conditions part of this, this is how they identified uh, those items. The fundamental conditions and resources for health, okay, 
are peace, shelter, education, food, income, a stable ecosystem, sustainable resources, social justice, and equity. Now there's a list, right? Health conditions, things that support health, okay? A lot of which aren't always real equitable, okay? And so when we start talking about, you know, health and well-being and, and health for all, okay, we have to think about, you know, how can we support people in that bigger sense of the word? How can we help people uh, that are trying to figure out, you know, their employment situation? How can we help people uh, and be a part of community initiatives or population targeted things uh, that are going to support education, okay, and success in education for people we work with, okay? Now, um, before I shift to this next slide, I said earlier, this is not a political statement. When I say health for all, I'm not saying Medicare for all. I'm not saying health care for all. I'm not doing all of that. This is within the context of population health and defining and understanding health. So I just want to make sure that you guys are pretty clear on that uh, because I'm pretty clear on that difference. Okay? All righty. So let's make a shift then and talk about population health. I identify population health as a second language because we all don't wake up and go, hey, I want to talk about population health and have any idea what that means, okay? Um, you know, I talked last night about um, some things that I had had to uh, grapple with in public administration. Um, that was a second language, all right? That was something where I had to learn the lingo there and even had to, you know, maybe uh, help, help you all understand a little bit of that before I could move forward last night. It's a different way of talking, right? And sometimes that makes it kind of tricky. You got a pub, you know, public health and population health over here talking about primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of care, okay? We talk about that as rehab <laughs> um, at that tertiary level, okay? And then we don't talk enough about some of the other levels, okay? Um, not because we're not capable, not because we shouldn't be there, but because it's a different language. It's a different way of thinking. And so um, I just share this with you um, because we need to continue to develop our understanding of population health. And we need to also not be afraid to share with people in population health arenas and in population health conversations. We have to not be afraid to share with them what occupational therapy brings to the table. Okay? Um, that, that's ours to do, and that's our job to do. And so that share knowledge piece is kind of where we are gonna start here. This quote up here, um, you've, if you've done history, you know, your history of OT, there's a lady, Geraldine Finn. I never met her, so. Um, 1972 though, she was talking my language, okay? Would have loved to. <laughs> See, that phone thing, I can just tell you, it is not me. So, okay. Um, I'll have to, I'll, if I have time, I'll share with you the story about how I, how I dealt with that in class. It was, it was comical. And so, but you had something to do with, you had to sing your alma mater. Um, and so, whew, that took care of it in a hurry. And so, uh, but anyway, Geraldine Finn in 1972, she says up here, we are a profession possessing knowledge that is particularly necessary to maintain the health of people. Okay? 1972, right out of the gates. We have something to offer, right? I mean, this is an occupational therapist. This is not some random person out there that's talking, you know, like we don't know, right? We are a profession possessing knowledge that is particularly necessary to maintain the health of people. That thing called occupation, right? That's what we're talking about. To move from therapist to health agent demands us to change, but to change in a forward, positive way. We do not have to give up what we know. We don't have to give up what we do every day. 
Rather, we must instead be willing to know more. Okay? We have to be willing to know more. We have to be willing to learn about population health. We have to be willing to learn about different systems where we might position ourselves. We have to be willing to learn about different business models or payment models. We have to learn different things that might tax us a bit, okay? Only because it's good right here. What if we've got to learn something else? It's a lifelong learning thing, folks. That's that thing that we do, okay? So we've got more to do. We've got more to share. So let's start with talking about populations and defining that, because usually that's kind of like the first place people start. Is so what really is a population? Right? There's a question. There's a lot of ways to, you know, define populations. But it's not just, you know, a group of people necessarily. It's not even necessarily the community. Okay? Um, this is a definition that Marjorie Scaffa and Maggie Reitz put into you know, some of the work that they've done in the community-based uh, you know, practice work and also in the ways that they're trying to uh, get their head around population health differently, right? Uh, they identify populations as aggregates of people with common attributes such as context, characteristics, or concerns, including health risks. This is a definition that's incorporated in the, uh, the newly revised and waiting for revision and approval, you know, occupational therapy practice framework four. Okay? This is one of the definitions that was pulled into that. So if you think about that, some different ways that we might define populations, it could be patients, it could be consumers of our services, it could also be people in a given geographic region that have a particular uh, common attribute, okay? Things that have some commonality there that they share. It might be socioeconomic, uh, you know, <laughs> kinds of, you know, characterizations or categorizations, I guess, uh, would be a better word. Um, you know, different cultural uh, kinds of aggregates. I mean, there are differences, there are health disparities as it relates to uh, people who are African American, as it re relates to our Hispanic communities, things like this. That, that's a thing. Okay? So those are populations that have some particular uh, needs. And then lived experiences. We work with people with disabilities sometimes. Yeah? We work with people that are on that recovery train sometimes in their mental health journey. I mean, they have lived experiences to share, things that we can learn from. There's caregivers. Caregivers is a huge population, aggregate of people um, with big needs. Um, they would be a population that we might want to think about uh, in these ways as well. Okay? So then if we think about population health, you know, basically the what's going on part there, you know, is that we are taking a look at uh, the different factors that influence their health. We're looking at variations. You know, what are differences? What are the things that, you know, we maybe need to capitalize on and get a better understanding of so that we can uh, support people differently, interact and provide some, uh, you know, some suggestions, some resources. We can be part of the solution. And then we apply what we know, okay, to help them, help with the development and implementation of particular uh, plans, programs, approaches, those kinds of things, okay? So we are working to address the health of that population as a whole. So some of our work might look a little different. You know, it might not be just me working with you in a direct care kind of situation, okay? It might be working with a bigger collective of people to try to identify how I can work with you in a different way, how we can have improved outcomes, how we can make some changes in that overall health of the population, okay? All righty. This always gets confused with public health. It's because they're close cousins, and it just, you know, some of it's just about language differences. 
Some of it is, you know, the context in which you're in, the people that you happen to be having the conversation with, you know, but there is a difference. And so I just, you know, put that up there as kind of a reminder of that. Uh, public health, the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. So they're really about trying to get us all on the same page as far as how we can be a healthier uh, kind of environment here, a healthier world, all right? So these are old school public health promotion posters, which I find to be just fascinating. Okay, old school public health posters, back in the day, right? I'm gonna say what day, but back in old school kind of days. And I looked at that, and, you know, and so for all the folks that are like, we have nothing in common with public health. We shouldn't be talking about population health. I'm just gonna go right there and have a conversation about that, okay? Um, I don't think you can see it in the back, but over here, we've got a guide for parents. All children want to learn. Wow. I mean, there's a population health opportunity for us in public schools that might be different sometimes than that, you know, one-on-one -on -one model, which is a challenge for the institution as a whole. I get that which is a challenge in some of the ways that people are comfortable doing practice, get that, okay? But that's one lens, you know, for maybe different ways that we can be looking at how do we support children and youth? And how do we support the parents that are a part of, of either early intervention, uh, public schools, transition needs, things like that. So a guide for parents, all children wanna learn. The one in the middle, he lifted this way instead of this. It's health promotion. It's injury prevention, right? I mean, these are primary intervention kind of opportunities here to work with people before they are trying to figure out how do I live with this illness? How do I uh, regroup after this injury? How do I live from a different ability vantage point rather than a disability vantage point, okay? so. You know, and the other one's just over there as a reminder. <laughs> so hot, season's not over yet, okay? Cover coughs, cover sneezes. We don't need to do that, okay? So I share those with you, though, because we're not that far away uh, from this thing called occupational therapy um, out there, okay? So isn't this the same as community health? This is, this is a question that, that comes up you know, often. And so um, you know, all I wanna say about this is a lot of population health focused work happens in the community, okay? It definitely does. But just because something's happening in the community doesn't make it population health, okay? It's a different lens. It's a different way of working with people. So, I mean, you can be in a community-based practice environment, but that not have a population health focus. You can be engaged in community health promotion, and that's getting closer, but even some of that can sometimes, you know, be more on a different scale rather than a population level scale. Community level intervention, you're starting to get at some of those systems things, you know, the stuff that's kind of around, and that may indeed be at that community level where you're working with some of your, you know, maybe local policymakers, where you're working with different, you know, systems people in your, in your area, in your community, to, to see, you know, how can we address, you know, this housing issue? How can we deal with this transportation concern, you know, for this particular, you know, catchment area? We'll define the population like this. How can we deal with the health disparity in this zip code? Okay? I mean, those are different kinds of conversations also. Community-centered initiatives and interventions, that's going to have an even closer population health lens and is going to take us right back to that person-centered lens 
as well, right? Because then that community becomes the center of what we do, how we think. And when we're looking at that community and actually hearing what they need through that, we might uncover population needs, okay? So it's a, it's a little bit different way of thinking about that. Um, it's kind of like when people, when we have conversations about population health and people say, well, I do population health all the time. I work with adolescent and adult popu or adolescent and adult psych population. That's not population health. That identifies people you love working with, but that's not necessarily population health, okay? These are nuances that are important to understand. Mm -hmm. Black community, what would that fall under then? If, if, so, could you look at like subsets of population and then looking at, at it as that whole kind of cohort together? Sure, you can. That as a population versus looking at it like everybody in this state or place. Yes. So, you could kind of classify it, which you're looking at the big picture versus individual. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question. And let me, I'm going to try to restate this, so, see if I get it. Um, I won't get every word, but I think the gist of what she's saying is, are we talking about like these like, like Mondo huge populations? Or are we, you know, is there room within our understanding of populations to uh, have subpopulations, be able to, uh, you know, capture a smaller group? I mean, population's not defined by numbers. You know, it's defined by those characteristics or those identifying common traits or concerns uh, that bring people together, and then you're wanting to do work to address those. Uh -huh. So it has to be a systemic approach to those members, basically. It doesn't have to be a systemic approach, um, but it can be something where, and we might, we might come around to this, but um, it doesn't have to be all at a systems level. It can be very much about, we want to work with uh, people in our community. We've seen a rise of, of concern in our community uh, about stroke, okay? We just, I mean, February's, you know, heart month, right? And particularly women have issues um, with cardiac events. Um, you know, population health can be, if you're looking at it on like a primary care level, or, a, or not primary care, a primary intervention or a primary prevention kind of level, you may be engaged in health promotion kinds of things that are a part of community events, community level intervention or initiatives that are trying to target a larger mass of people. They're trying to reach out and educate. They're trying to help people understand their risk factors uh, that they may or may not have. It's trying to get out there to everybody. So that's not necessarily a systemic approach. Now, you can get systemic, you know, and, and start talking about, you know, what are the needs in the community uh, if you have people that have uh, greater uh, cardiac concerns, if you have, uh, you know, black women in your community that are showing up at the hospital and we're trying to figure out what are some you know, issues, and we're happening to find that you know, they're not supported, uh, perhaps, in being able to access uh, ways for activities. Um, you know, do we have a different kind of issue? Is that a systems concern? And when you're, when you're thinking about, um, I just think, you know, I mean, in our town, I don't, I don't know about you guys, you probably don't have it quite here in Finley. In my town, we have problems with violence, okay? Um, you know, what are things we could do? That needs to be a systemic kind of thing, but it also, you know, as a policy kind of deal, but it also needs to be a what's going on in the community kind of thing, and how are we coming together as community partners um, so that we can support uh, some change around uh, relationships, around, uh, you know, intersections between community and services that might be helpful, you know, police that might be helpful, you know, things like that. So it becomes a different kind of conversation, but that's a good question. Um, the, um, whoops. The, the next thing I just want to point out, this triple aim, have you guys heard about this? Institute for Healthcare Improvement yeah. and the triple aim, that should be something that's like right there, right? Another piece of this big push toward population health, so I'm not going to spend time on that. I think everyone at this point has either heard that or if you haven't, Put in IHI triple aim and it's going to tell you this is the place where population health really started to get a big old thrust 
in, the, in uh, healthcare reform, okay? That also created a good deal of stress for people because they did not know how they were going to do this thing called population health. What's it mean? How do we prepare people? How is this going to uh, affect the people we serve? How's it gonna affect our workforce? Because not only was it about population health, it was, that it was also holding people accountable for the experience of care and cost. So that shifted some things, but population health was really thrust into the limelight, I guess, um, as part of that systems approach um, to our healthcare system. Equity becomes a part of that conversation. Um, this is a part of you know, many of the other things that we talked about, so I'll kind of leave that there, okay? The interprofessional education collaboration, okay? This is a group of folks that came together um, to talk about interprofessional collaboration in education and practice. Um, the very first work that they did in 2011, they put out you know, this document identifying what were interprofessional collaborative competencies. Okay, and so you had roles and responsibilities, you had values and ethics, you had teamwork, you had communication, all these kinds of things. One of the things though that they figured out as time went on as you know, Triple Aim you know, started getting its legs, all those kinds of things, is we have put forth a document here that is really um, not fully uh, considering the range of interprofessional partners that might be different in a population health kind of environment. Uh, and so they had to, whoops, you guys can just say something, move the slide, mm, so, okay? Uh, so what they did uh, was a revision that broadened those competencies to better achieve the triple aim and also to put a greater emphasis on population health. Many of the population health partners, the interprofessional collaborators that people have in working in population health arenas, it's not necessarily OTPT and speech. And it's very possible that you are not going to have a doc driving the show. Okay. So we have to think differently about who are the people that we're connecting with. And when you're in a correctional facility, there's a different cast of players there that you're working with to be able to enter in, to be able to you know, get those connections with folks so that you can do your best work there, okay? That's oftentimes a very different group of people. It also requires an expanded you know, kind of uh, view of the competencies um, that you have as well, okay? Healthy People 2020, no news there. They're all about health. They're all about you know, individuals. They're all about population. But they're also very much about health disparities and health equities. Or, and they're also very much about social determinants of health. Okay? So these social determinants of health thing, that is a place where we should be leading the way. Okay? I mean, what do we know about the built environment? We know a ton. We know a ton. We make a huge difference in those places. What do we know about health? What do we know about how important sound education is and how to access that? We know a bunch of that. How about our awareness and understanding of community and social integration? so that people aren't in isolation. I mean, we know about that stuff, okay? But we also have to think then about how does that intersect with, you know, the work that we do as occupational therapists. I'd say it goes right along with that thing we have called context, okay? So let's think about it. We have to think bigger, but we have to think about it. Health starts with individual responsibility. That's a big deal. But health intersects with social determinants of health. Um, that's the part where we can do some of our work, okay? It's that same diagram. So what's that look like, right? Jobs, nutrition, housing, support for elders and veterans. You think? Special education services. You know, disability services. Occupational therapy is all over that, all over that. Okay, but it might not be the thing that we wake up in the morning and say, hey, that's me today. Okay, so I'm encouraging you to think about some different ways to think about you. Okay, everyone deserves an equal opportunity to make the choices that lead to good health. 
Um, we help people try to figure that out, don't we? And make their own good decisions. That's what we do. I kind of like that idea. Okay. So welcome to the future then, right? Occupational therapy is a part of that future, all right? Now, for those of you that are sitting there holding onto your chair and are horrified, I'll never be able to do occupational therapy like I've done it for the last however long. That's not true. This isn't asking us to like just, you know, flip everything on its head. It's asking us to have a complimentary way of looking at the work that we do, okay? So don't set it over here as something that, that we're not doing, can't do, all those kinds of things. I, I want you to really, you know, recognize the places where this might be challenging for you, but it's also uh, a place where we need to think about how we address those challenges. You know, this is going to happen. This is happening all the time already. And the degree to which we engage in the conversations are a part of program development, uh, where we're willing to look at different uh, payment models, things like that. I mean, that's going to make a difference in how we are a part of solutions and circumstance there. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting on the sidelines. I guarantee you that. There's a little thing. Anybody remember? Uh, some of you will have no clue. You weren't even born yet, so I'm just going to preface it with that, okay? Uh, but, there was a, but you've heard about it. You've heard about it in your history, I bet. Uh, you know, a thing called deinstitutionalization. Anybody, anybody have that um, in your memory banks? Right? And what happened there, right? We're going to do, we're going to do things differently. We want to be bringing people out into the community. We want to deinstitutionalize people. We want to deinstitutionalize the system. We want a response that's different. We want a solution that's different. And I've been reading some things as of late about that period of time, which was very interesting to me. Um, one of them uh, is an article. And these are occupational therapy articles. I just chose not to include them because I didn't want to want to you know, step on anybody's toes too badly. Um, I can, but I won't. That's not that's not helpful. But one of the articles that I, I read was that um, we have this you know deinstitutionalization thing that's going on, and by golly, we better fix these institutions so they recognize that people need to stay in the institutions. Okay, this was occupational therapy folks talking back in the, you know, like 80s, whatever that was, um, before that actually. Uh, you know, but it was a weird thing where it was like, we have to do what? Things are changing. We're not gonna be able to say, you know, hold the phone. That population health thing that's all over the place is not going to go away, okay? One of the things we didn't do very well during that deinstitutionalization era was, in my view, this is a windy view, we did not deinstitutionalize occupational therapists or occupational therapy assistants, okay? And so we continued to do the things in the places that were familiar, the places that were comfortable, a system we knew, but we did not respond well to the part that was changing in that environment. And I can speak about that because that's the practice area that I love. I mean, that's my work life, adolescent and adult psych. Love it. So it pains me every time that I know that there's a reality that we have, you know, 40% of our population at one point, our profession, working in mental health kinds of environments. And then now we're lucky if we've got 4%. Right? And yet the need is so great. Okay? So I say this not to bash on people of old or people of new, but to say that it's going to happen. And we have to make a decision about if we engage with that process, if we are on that train or not, uh, because that train will go. And I really think it's going to be important for us to not be sitting on the sidelines um, as that continues to evolve. Okay? So. Can I come back to you? Okay, thank you. All righty. So I'm just acknowledging that this is a bit of a paradigm shift, a different way of thinking. 
Fair enough. I've had to think about a lot of things differently in my life, haven't you? Okay. Didn't mean I abandoned other things, but it meant I did have more information to work with. I want to point out here, it says an important change that happens when the usual way of thinking about or doing something is replaced by a new and different way. I'm going to, I'm going to replace the word replaced. Okay. Because it doesn't have to be about a replacement. It needs to be about a collaborative, you know, complementary journey here. So that's what we're going to do. But we can take out that word, put in a different word. I'm good with that because I do think that this is an important change that happens as we start thinking about some different ways of doing. Okay? AOTA, that vision, you know, you guys know that centennial vision, right? That was 2017. As we were approaching 2017, we all of a sudden had this awareness of like, shoot, 2017 is going to happen. Then what are we going to do? Right? What's our vision then? What do we want to be past that 2017? And we had to think about that. So you've seen this. If you haven't, you're seeing it now, right? This is a part of changes happening in our profession, okay? Now, you can say what you want to about vision statements, mission statements, strategic plan, da 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 da, -da. I, I get that. Sometimes um, that seems like uh, a whole lot of words on a slide a whole lot of documents in a folder. I understand how that can be kind of, you know, tucked away in your brain like that sometime. Uh, but I want to assure you, this is not tucked away in the work that we're doing at AOTA. It's not tucked away uh, and out of sight, out of mind at the board table. And I don't want it to be tucked away and out of sight for you. I want you to think about this vision and what that means for our profession moving forward. There's a whole lot of things in there, some of which we talked about yesterday as an inclusive profession, right? Uh, that's a piece of this. But looking at health, well-being, and quality of life, there's nothing in there about how many days does a person live, right? It's about health, well-being, quality of life. People, populations, and communities, right? Effective solutions. That, that facilitate participation in everyday life. Population's a part of that. It wasn't an accident. It was on purpose, okay? And that's part of what helps us think about, and I wanted to help you think about, you know, directions for yourself, okay? ACODE's thinking about this, all right? This is a part of educational standards, right? The people that help your faculty identify some of the things that they don't want to overlook in their comprehensive education and 200 and how many standards, right? ACO does a big job to try to figure out what all is going on in our profession. What's entry level? What's not entry level? How much emphasis? What level of emphasis? All these kinds of things, okay? So, uh, so I applaud ACO for paying attention. But I also want to point out the difference here, I mean, they are paying attention, which means this is going to be a part of education. It also means that there's a need for us to help educators understand what population health uh, is really about and how are the things, what are things that we can do to support that. You know, is it helpful to have uh, some shared language and curriculum about it? ACO went from having like zero mention of population health and some isolated mentions about population uh, to having, you know, population health mentioned 11 times. That sounds big. Uh, there's four categories. It equates to two standards, so let's be clear about that. But it's two standards, okay, that address population health, all right? And it has that mention in there. Population is like populating that, that document in many ways. Um, one of the things about it, you know, this part, um, let me see, wrong one. You know how it has people, populations, and communities in there? Sometimes, you know, things get stuck in documents, and I'll just recognize that too, where it's like, we're going to do this, 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 and address the needs of people, populations, and communities. And like, it's like, it's like the tagline at the end that just like falls off and doesn't really get attention, but it gets a whole lot of count when you do the find. So it looks like a really big thing, right? I'm bringing this up because population health is what we're talking about. 
we want to serve all those people across the board, but population health is what we're talking about, and I'm glad to see ACODE is on that, um, you know, on that wa wagon as well. Our practice framework is in the fourth edition. There, hopefully the revisions will be uh, reviewed, they're in review now. Hopefully they'll be at the representative assembly uh, coming up in Boston. And we have an opportunity to actually, uh, you know, start working with this. And the big part of the uh, Occupational Therapy Practice Framework 4 uh, included an emphasis on groups and populations, an expanded focus on groups and populations, okay? Not because they were sitting in a room isolated and said, ooh, that sounds like something we should do, but because they were getting feedback from people in the education community, people in the practice community, people in general saying, we need to be paying attention to this, okay? We need to be incorporating this and providing some guidance for people so that they can start to understand what is this thing called populations and population health. So uh, this is coming to the AOTA bookstore near you, I'm sure, uh, very soon, uh, or uh, something that we will be available to you through your AOTA membership, another member benefit. So, okay? All righty. Occupational therapy and the promotion of health and well-being. We've had this paper for a long time. It's up for review now, okay? And part of what they're doing in that paper is extending uh, the conversation to include uh, population health. Uh, that's not gonna be enough, but it's a start and it's happening. They do incorporate a population health uh, approach kind of language in there. So we do have an opportunity to uh, hear about that uh, coming up. They incorporate some of that population health, public health language in that paper, okay? And I'm talking specifically about the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of prevention. So they, they do incorporate that in there as a way to help people start to understand and, and introduce those things uh, alongside what does that mean for our intervention uh, kinds of opportunities in our practice framework. They're not out here. We just have to continue to help make some links uh, as we go forward, okay? This conversation is not necessarily new. Um, you know, we've had opportunities to think about population health. Um, we've had opportunities to do work on population health. Uh, unfortunately, we've also had um, you know, things that we've had to kind of deal with amongst ourselves as far as differences in viewpoints about population health. That's not the first time that we've had, you know, different views about things in our profession. Uh, but it became kind of a thing. We had, there was a charge uh, from the board of directors back in, you know, 2014, 2015, uh, charging the folks in the Commission on Practice uh, you know, do something about this, right? What are we doing here to kind of, kind of come up with a statement of sorts, uh, do some work in this regard? And they certainly uh, took that charge seriously. There are, you know, folks that, that definitely get it. Um, they identified an author, they identified content experts, they identified folks to work on how can we, you know, kind of capture this and talk about it and, and uh, put it out there for folks in our profession. So they did have a good work on that, but they were unable when it got down to it after a lot of that work had been done over the course of about 18 months, um, kind of had a little stalemate kind of thing, right? Which changed the outcome, which meant no outcome, no final document or direction for the RA to consider because there was a lack of consensus on occupational justice. Now there's a thing, isn't there? Okay? And that's not saying one was right or one was wrong, it's just saying that's where the conversation got challenging. Okay? And where, as we've started to enter back into this, where we're very aware of that, and also very aware of the need for us to continue to move forward. This is a funny word, isn't it? Um, consensus. Is there consensus on anything with everyone in this room? 
I just have to ask the question because I don't know how that goes. Um, you know, we do need, though, to have respectful dialogue. We do need to have opportunities, um, you know, to consider viewpoints, and we need to have, uh, you know, that space to allow people to not be in a consensus place sometimes, okay, and still be respectful of some different viewpoints. You know, there's things in our official documents. I'm betting you don't agree with every piece of them, right, every single piece. It's just a hunch based on my own experience, <laughs> right? But that doesn't mean that I look at those and say there's no merit. Um, it doesn't mean that I look at those and say um, those people that are very passionate about that, what's wrong with them? There's nothing wrong with them. They're passionate about it. And they're trying to do what they can do to bring evidence to the conversation. Uh, to bring some kind of information that helps people feel more informed or more connected to that work. So we hope that we do that too. I just put this up here to think about um, you know, social justice or occupational justice. They're two different things, all righty. Um, occupational justice, do you want me to move that? You guys, you're falling down on your job. Uh, the right of every individual to be able to meet basic needs and to have equal opportunities and life chances to reach toward her or his potential, but specific to the individual's engagement in diverse and meaningful occupation. That's occupational justice. Okay? This is Wilcock and Townsend. We can go back to the early slide, right? Stuff that, that I think is helpful in our conversation here. But sometimes it does get confused or, you know, I mean, like I said, they're close cousins, but there's a difference, right? There's a difference between social justice and occupational justice. So if you think about that, all you got to do is look at some of these words, unfortunately. You can look at these words and see where some of these might be triggers for people. And either they're triggers in a way where they will not engage in the conversation or where they can't hear other views, okay? And sometimes that makes it tricky. So I'm just calling that for the reality that it is. Uh, that should not mean that we are not interested in people accessing meaningful occupations, right? There's, the, there's to me, a big difference right there. But maybe I'm the only one that sees it as a big difference. Um, you know, someone at, a, at another talk that I did, um, it, was, it was pretty interesting uh, because he was in the back of the room. He said, I think the problem is that every time we talk about occupational stuff, nobody knows what we're talking about. So maybe we could make more headway here. We could get more traction with this, this thing if we just stop talking about it as occupational justice and talk to just about social justice, quote unquote, because everyone supports social justice. And that's just one of those where I kind of had to go, I really hope someone in the audience has a response to this because I don't think I need to have that response, right? And it did come from the audience that said, gosh, Wish that was true, but it's really not, okay? So that too is something that, you know, as we start to talk about these things and we think about it as, uh, as work that maybe is more, uh, you know, community situated, that's more population focused, that has maybe a broad, more broad societal lens, you know, I hope we don't get caught up in the part of it that does seem to get confused here. We're about people accessing the things that are meaningful to them in their daily life, okay? There's a whole lot of things that gets in the way of that. Some of it's that, okay? But for us, we need to keep our eye on this part where everyone has the right to be able to meet basic needs and have equal opportunities and life chances to reach toward her or his potential but specific to the individual's engagement in diverse and meaningful occupations. That's our thing, okay? 
So I just want to want to point that out. It gets fuzzy around the edges. Um, it'll stay fuzzy in some places, but uh, it's still a pretty solid place for us to work from. Okay. Happening now. AOTA Population Health Task Force is a happening now. And I said that was a, a priority of the current uh, board of directors. Um, and so, shoot, you guys, fail number three. Okay, help me move. Um, you know, the AOTA Board of Directors, uh, they, are, they are taking this seriously. Uh, we passed a motion last June that said, we know this is coming and we know that we have a lot of work to do to help us all understand this better. <clears throat> and in helping us understand it better, help us also then be able to identify the ways where we can uh, you know, be most integrated into these conversations, into these systems, uh, and be effective in the work that we're doing and, and trying to support. So we did put a motion forward that said we need to get some people together to know what they're talking about with this, or at least are willing to learn more, right? So we pulled together an ad hoc group with knowledge and interest in the field of population health to explore the relevance of this area to, to the occupational therapy profession and opportunities for the profession and for AOTA. So we've done that. This was last week, okay? before coming here, uh, like, like a week ago today, <laughs> was that right? Gosh, we could go la last Thursday out at our uh, AOTA uh, office. We brought together this group of people. Um, we'd had other calls, we'd had a couple of calls building up to this, uh, but this was a chance for us to come together in the same room and have some good face-to-face, person-to-person dialogue and work about population health related things, okay? So our day looked like this. I'm just giving you like the snapshot of the day kind of thing. Um, I mean, we had to have that same conversation we're having, right? Making sure that we're all on the same page or at least the same direction in terms of defining population health and understanding the context of occupational therapy within that. We talked about potential models relevant to population health. Uh, there is the participatory occupational justice framework that might sound familiar to some folks. Um, it's very much about enable, enablement and empowerment and, and people being able to access those things um, in ways that have a justice base. Uh, we talked about uh, the PEO model. There's a lot of folks that you know, draw on that when you're trying to marry up you know, determinants of health and context and things like that in support of people in their daily occupations. You know, how does that work? Um, we talked about um, the public health models. How do we you know, take that language, connect those things easier for folks so that we can make that stuff uh, you know, something easier to get your head around. So, I mean, there's a lot of different things uh, that we've talked about, socioecological module, models, things along that line. We also talked about the need to have our eyes and ears out for found pilots, okay? Found pilots and population health examples. Chuck Wilmarth, you anybody know Chuck? Chuck Wilmarth is, uh, he works for AOTA, he's a state, a state affairs uh, guru. And, uh, and has been with AOTA for a number of years. And if you know Chuck, he's a very stoic fella. Uh, he's a big guy, pretty stoic. He's got one of those dry sense of humor kind of things where you're like, oh, there you go. I see what's going on in there. Uh, very smart man. And he's one of those that listens a lot. So when he says something, I mean, it, it is to the point. It is concise, and it's like... I'm going to think about that for a little while. And I was in a meeting out there about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, where we were, I was with the policy group and the people that are, you know, having questions about payment, practice changes, things like that. And we were talking about population health. And, uh, and there was a question about, is this really happening? Are people doing this? It's like, yes, people are doing this. They are doing this. We have a lot of people that are doing this, but we have not been able to capture their stories. We've not been able to showcase how they've been able to bridge that. And there's also people that are doing this that have not felt supported by their occupational therapy community because it doesn't look like the others. And in some ways felt not supported by AOTA 
because IOTA had not committed you know, to really paying attention to that change uh, in the landscape out there. And so Chuck Wilmarth says, Wendy, you need found pilots. And I'm like, okay, I need more information too because I'm not sure you know, where, what that is. And so he, he mentioned a book to me. It's called The, Change, uh, the Moment You Can't Ignore. And in that book, it talks about you know, found pilots, how you have things going on out there. You have things going on around. You have different, like in a big system, where everything's going you know, haywire. And then you have that one little unit over here of people that are knocking it out. They've got it done. You know, don't overlook those people, right? And he was saying, he said, I think you might want to read the part about found pilots. And you know, I really paid attention to that. And so I share that with you because the found pilots in our population health kind of group, I, some of those are people that have felt like people questioned if their work as an occupational therapist or occupational therapy assistant was truly occupational therapy because it wasn't a direct one-to-one -one service. We got to get bigger than that in our view of what we offer and in the ways that we deliver, okay? So we had an opportunity to talk about some found pilots. We're on the hunt. And then we looked at AOTA official documents and population health and education and practice, and we've also uh, you know, laid some groundwork for some next steps for AOTA, okay? So do we fit? We fit, all right? And I'm just looking, I see 1045, right? And so I have about 15 minutes maybe and questions. I just wanna make sure I'm right, because if not, I'll do it differently. So anyway, so the how does occupational therapy fit then? We fit kind of like this, okay? Now they're squishy lines, right? It's kind of messy. But I'm guessing we do a whole lot of messy in places that people think is really tidy. That's my, my thought. But we know that there's maybe some squigglies, there's maybe some mess. But one thing that's pretty clear is, to me is we fit in the ways that we have an understanding about self-management by people. If we're talking about folks and we're talking about chronic disease management for a given population that we've identified, I mean, what are the self-management strategies that we can work with people individually? It's not like you have to do one or the other, right? It's not a one or the other thing. It's a population health understanding. It's a mindset. And that may indeed be something where you're then doing on a bigger scale, work with a population to address these self-management needs. But that also might translate into you know, individuals within that population needing specific care. And you have a better understanding of that. You have a, a, a more broad way to address some of their individual concerns. Family involvement? I mean, that's a thing. Do we do that? And if we're talking about working with populations, they're not by themselves. And in fact, I would suggest that there's, there's folks that are family members in and of themselves that are populations that we are missing out on in terms of our opportunity to support them. Anybody uh, have someone close to you with Alzheimer's? Mm-hmm. That takes a village, doesn't it? That's hard work. Those are caregivers that are in need of emotional support, that are in need of resources, identifying how they too can live their best life while supporting the best life of their loved ones. Right? So, I mean, that's a population that needs incredible, you know, attention. You know, we just, just appointed the uh, public member, public advisor for, or not public, a uh, consumer advisor for the board of directors. It's a woman with substantial caregiver experience and caregiver experience for herself personally and also uh, in the work that she has done uh, in corporate stuff to support caregivers as well. So I'm really looking forward to us benefiting from what she brings to the table. 
and being able to recognize that that's maybe something that we've not given a lot of attention to as far as our opportunity to support that particular population. But anyway, so that's a family involvement piece. Clinical expertise and systems, we have something to offer, right? Work and school support. I mean, any students in the room doing that activity analysis thing? <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps. Right? So you might have an understanding of how do you support people, you know, in their school, in their work environment. You know, how are, how are we able to do that? What, how can we address that from a population level? Um, anybody familiar with uh, Susan Basic's work? I, I believe she's in Iowa, or Ohio, right? Except she's not in Ohio right now. She's actually having a good time elsewhere. But she does wonderful work looking at how to support you know, the population health needs in school environments. Okay? A health promotion strategy, something we don't do enough of. Community awareness and action. Shoot, there's vocal people in this room. There's passionate people in this room. There's great collaborators in this room, right? That's what happens when that community comes together, right? We draw on all those, we pull everybody together, or we hear different viewpoints. Uh, we can be a part of working toward increasing awareness of health needs, increasing an understanding and taking action to make changes in our environments or cities or communities that are going to impact the health of a given population. These are things we can do. Environmental measures. Policy, I see occupational therapy, okay? So that search for found, for found pilots, I mean, that's a real thing. If I'm talking out here and you're saying she's talking about me, she just doesn't know me yet, then I need to know you. I need to know you. I need to hear from you, right? Because I don't know everybody out there. If you guys got the lock on it, more power to you, because, boo, I'll be tired at the end of the day if that was the expectation, right? I'm counting on people, counting on people to make themselves known, counting on people to say, this person over here, you need to talk to them, okay, so that we can continue uh, to build uh, this group of folks that are tuned into population health in a big way. Okay. So for all the folks out there, we talked about faders yesterday. I'm going to call, I'm not going to refer to you guys in this way, but there's a lot of haters as such, people saying, we don't do that. We do. We do. Okay? And these are some of the ways in which that looks. Okay? This is just a little bitty snapshot. All right? You all have a backpack awareness day kind of thing ever? I mean, that, that's something that Karen Jacobs started. I know that she was one of the lecturers uh, for this particular lectureship along the way, you know, past president for AOTA. And her bag is all about health and the workplace in particular, ergonomics, all this kind of thing. And she was concerned, right, about what's going on in that backpack. <laughs> you know, it's weighing me down. It's causing me musculoskeletal issues. Uh, and we're starting at an early age. She was concerned about that. So if that's something that, uh, that you haven't seen, you might want to go to AOTA's website. Because if you think about Backpack Awareness Day, that's very much an attempt to address population health kinds of concerns. Right? I mean, she's not going in there doing an assessment on each individual in the school system. She's saying this group of children in this elementary school are coming in with more weight in their backpack than they've got on their skeleton. Right? How can we address this? All right? Be interesting to see how this changes, you know, because the backpacks aren't as heavy anymore. Right? When you've got a lot of electronic resources now, you know, Maybe we need to be shifting that to identify screen time kinds of related issues. You know, homework loads that come with that. You know, start and finish to a school day. You know, I mean, these are policy things that might have a health impact. I was, I was surprised when I was in California in the fall. Uh, they were the first state, uh, I, I think it was a state thing. I was, in, I was in Southern California for the OTAC conference. And while I was there, uh, they passed the law to start the school day later. 
uh, because of that part where you know you got kids waking up at five o'clock in the morning uh, to then have a very long school day. So you know there's room around that. If you think you can, we can look at backpack awareness as an example of an initiative taking place from like a population health kind of head, a public health kind of head. But it also is an opportunity for, to, opportunity for us to think about in that space. Is there other stuff that we can do? Are there other ways, ways that we can intersect in that conversation to support children's health, youth health, in their school day, in their academic environments, things like that? Might be something to think about. A car fit. That's the other end of life, right? We've got elder drivers. And how are they fitting in their car? That's an AOTA initiative. It's been a longstanding partnership between, you see here, it's, it's uh, AOTA, uh, AAA, AARP. Remember what I talked about? Interprofessional collaboration and those partners needing to be different? I mean, they're agency partners. That's a collaboration. And those are some opportunities for us to then think about, wow, in a big way, how can we extend our reach? and support health for elder drivers, okay? I mean, what's that one thing that you don't want to have happen as you age? You don't want to have to give up that license. I mean, if you like driving, now if you don't like driving, it's a great way to be a driving Miss Daisy kind of situation, but if you don't want to give that up, that's your mark of independence. You know, that's an opportunity for us to address those kinds of needs, and we've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, lifestyle redesign. You know, the well elderly study that came out of USC, that was a pretty groundbreaking study. That was a big deal kind of thing. We're going to look at well elderly. Here's a population to think about, right? And the intervention work, interventions uh, that are incorporated into that have an awful lot of health promotion, you know, self-management kind of uh, approaches to that. It's a really good example of thinking about that population, but also knowing that the interventions that are provided are going to be beneficial to the individuals that represent that population. Okay? So, again, it's one of those where we don't have to throw it all out. We just have to think a little differently. Chronic disease management, primary care needs us. That's a place for population health, too. Okay? Population health isn't just about working with people that don't have means. It's about working with populations, okay? And we all belong to populations in this room. We could all be categorized, clustered in some way, okay? Uh, sometimes people get confused and think uh, that population health is only working with people that are in the community and either are low income or they don't have insurance or these kinds of things. Uh-uh. This is all people. That's all people. That's all people. That's all people. Okay? And all those people as part of those populations. Okay? Empowerability, creating access for life. Our current vice president, you know, Deb Young, I mean, that's something that she's passionate about. How do you equip your home so that you can live in your home? She's right now, she's working, she's got the coolest thing going on. She's working with builders uh, so that we can uh, find out more about what's going on in that space. Uh, well building kinds of opportunities. Also working with uh, folks that are in low income environments, elders in low income environments that just wanna stay in the place where they live, an aging in place kind of thing, but also aging within my pocketbook kind of thing. Right? What are the changes that can happen here that can help me be where I am when I don't have means? Okay? 2020 mom, that's about maternal mental health. How about that? Apple is one of the people that's in that uh, picture, that population health task force. And she's very active. She's been all over social media since she was out in Washington, D.C. because she was at the 2020 mom conference and she was a part of that facilitating group okay, that's looking at maternal mental health. Huge, 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 huge. And that, I mean, that's a primary care space. That's working in the medical model that we know 
to bring a different perspective. Okay? This is what we're talking about. Every moment counts. That should be familiar. That's, that's Susan's work. Okay? And then in Ingrid Koenig. Uh, Koenig, she is in, she was in Colorado. Now she's just moved to North Carolina. She is all about universal design, accessible playgrounds and communities. Does some fascinating stuff uh, in the community to make play possible. Right? These are population health initiatives. Now, this is very different than sometimes the way we prepare our students right now. Because it, it does have a different business sense a little bit. Okay? It also, though, is an opportunity for us to maybe be more responsive to some of our you know, incoming students. And at this time where things are changing in our skilled nursing environments or payment kind of things, you know, sometimes it gives all of us a chance to kind of retool ourselves. You know, things we don't know, things we need to know more about. You know, how can we get more tools in our toolbox maybe to help position us a little bit differently and increase our confidence in some of these areas, okay? So when people are saying we don't do population health, we do, okay? So where do we grow now? We have to be thinking population, okay? So health promotion and prevention, we have opportunities there, whether it is in developing and providing health promotion programs, whether it's about modifying existing uh, kinds of things that are going on there, promoting self-advocacy and self-management. These are things that we're good at. These are things we can contribute to the equation. So we need to be you know, kind of thinking about those opportunities. We need to have our eyes out and not be afraid of those other IPE partnerships. They might not be as familiar, but they might be more familiar if we were in those spaces, okay? Not only would they become more familiar to us, we'd become people that they recognize on a regular basis too. And that goes a long way at who do I call about this? I want to call my occupational therapy folks, okay? Community health assessments, that's a big thing. Uh, out, in, um, out in New Jersey right now, they're doing community health assessments and, and things uh, that are coming back to their hospitals and saying, you know, we have concerns about fall prevention. You know, we have these issues. These are our top issues. Transportation has been an issue. How can people get on board with this? Okay? So there's things happening where people are identifying concerns and issues, and they're looking for people to be a part of those kind of conversations, those solution conversations. So how could we do more in that way? Health impact assessments, you know, that, that's about like if there's, you know how, um, let me see, when there's a policy that comes up in Washington, they're supposed to have a, a budget review, right? CBO report um, that says, this policy is going to cost this much money to implement. What's the impact budgetarily, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we had a health impact assessment on those as well? You know, could maybe have that conversation with people about how important that would be if we really want to be, uh, you know, a, a society that looks at health for all people. Okay, policy and system advocates. That's a place where we can be. Overall, we can be change agents. Okay, so we're the missing piece. There's a lot of unanswered questions out there. There's a lot of unmet needs out there. And this population thing and this surge in the attention to that is because everybody's starting to recognize that. Okay? Now, we'll see if it becomes like a rhetoric thing, but then 10 years from now, everybody's like, I don't know why we spent all that time on population health. I'm guessing that's not how it's going to happen. Okay? So I'd really encourage us to not set it aside as a passing uh, fad, but really embrace it as an opportunity for us to uh, showcase what we bring as occupational therapy, okay? So I hope I've given you something to chew on. I hope I've given you some reason to question yourself and talk with others about those questions. More than that, I hope I've given you some reason to take action in the places where you are, okay? And I just thank you for your time. Okay.
That's my Valentine's Day thank you. Do you notice? <laughs> yes, I did know what day it was. So, indeed. So we've got a few minutes here. And uh, you know, if people have questions, I'm happy to, whether it's about this or whether it's about other things, I'm happy to, to take those questions. Um, if you're just happy it is Friday and Valentine's Day, um, you know, it will not hurt my feelings either if we don't have that. But um, I can be available here, not a problem. Yes, uh-huh. It's supposed to be in front of the, she's asking, do we have a release date for the revised occupational therapy practice framework four? And that is supposed to be coming before the representative assembly at the conference in March. That's the, that's the timeline, that's the track. Um, I, don't, I don't know what could get in the way of that, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure something could, but I don't know what it is. It's supposed to be at the RA uh, in March, at the end of March. I think it'll be I think it'll be that fairly quick, okay. like like be able to uh, incorporate that in things in quickly. <laughs> okay. We're going June first. June first. I see. I see. Okay. I'll have to do a follow up question. <laughs> okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. So how do, I know that like backpack awareness day and you know that that's just we get the publication from AOT and we can do it on our own. Sure. But is, to be sustainable it has to the money has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if we're billing for patient care, we're able to build a person's insurance. Mm -hmm. But how do we do that without treating a specific person and billing their insurance? Mm -hmm. That's a good question and it's always a thing. And I appreciate you asking about it uh, as a payment question not a reimbursement question. Because we, we can start right there with what I think is a need for us to uh, have a change in some of our mindset. Because um, we are very much um, you know, connected to the reimbursement models that are out there, and which I think uh, in some part uh, contributes also to big concerns when you have a PDGM kind of thing happening, a PDPM thing happening, if that's the only stream that you're floating down or up is the one that connects you to that kind of reimbursement, okay? So one thing that I do believe, and it's not just about population health, it's about many things, is that we need to continue to um, to identify alternate payment models and ways of, ways of addressing uh, that for people that want to access our services and also for us as service providers. Um, a conversation that, that we've had, um, you know, that, that Population Health Task Force uh, that we've had uh, at the board, that I certainly have with just, you know, just my peeps at home, you know, that kind of stuff, is um, the part where, if, you're, if you are doing these kinds of things, it's not like you wake up today and say, I'm going, today is my population health day and I have to have it set in this box. Sometimes it's about being a part of a program or a project and you're aligned in that. You get paid for that, right? Um, sometimes we are gonna have to see, uh, are there, uh, is it there like a coming together of employment options? One of the things that we're hearing a lot of, and I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm just hearing it in a weird way, um, you know, but you know, happy to hear differently, uh, is that people are, are changing the way they're wanting to work. There's not that 40-hour uh, week, I'm staying at one place every day, all day kind of thing, but are willing to maybe look at some different ways to you know, commit their time to this project at this particular agency, and then also working here in this you know, hospital or facility providing other care. So they're kind of, you know, they've, they've taken a, I'm going to piece together, and I don't mean piece in a bad way. I want these, both of these things are priorities for me or opportunities for occupational therapy, and I'm going to do that. 
So people have to make decisions about that too, how they want to do their work life and their work balance. But um, the part about if you're developing a program, if you're developing a grant, if you are wanting to connect with folks in these agencies, I mean, they're probably not saying, well, and we have to get on CMS's list for reimbursement. They're looking at what's the value of occupational therapy in this project, in this program, and this is how much we're going to pay for that, and oh, by the way, that equates to one occupational therapist or one occupational therapy assistant for this period of time, okay? There's that. The other thing is we've got to be willing to kind of jump into some of those spaces, okay? Um, I mean, we are, my health insurance goes through my employer. I mean, so, I mean, that's another part of, you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, step out of doing what we've done for a lifetime and think about something else. And so that's why I'm reminding people that's not what we're saying. We're saying, though, that there are opportunities to do things differently. For somebody, they might have an opportunity in front of them to make a jump. You know, they might be jumping into a public health position somewhere that has its own set of benefits, but are able to do that as an occupational therapist or an occupational therapy assistant. I mean, that's a thing. That's a thing. I mean, there's a woman in, in Washington, state of Washington, and she works for a uh, United Methodist, uh, you know, national organization. And she goes out and does their disability assessments, their accessibility assessments uh, at places. That's her job. She's an occupational therapist. I mean, she works for them. It's not a reimbursement thing. This is her job. It's her title. It's her expertise she's bringing. And that's how she is, you know, making that connection between addressing needs of a bigger population and working within a particular, you know, system, association, agency, you know, however you want to call that. So uh, it does require you to think differently. I think it's tempting, and I get it, I understand, uh, it's tempting, you know, like to come out of school and, you know, you're looking for that job in that place that is a familiar model, something you've seen on your field work, um, you know, something that you've had conversations about in your classroom, uh, or something that pays big money, okay? You have to make decisions about how you want to do your work. You have to make decisions about trade-offs that you're willing to make, and sometimes, you know, those decisions then will lead you this way or that in terms of how you craft, how you do your work. So, I mean, the payment thing is a deal. I mean, everybody wants money. Everybody wants paid. So um, that makes sense. But I mean, I'm not. I would prefer to have a paycheck. It comes in really handy uh, when the bills come in the mail. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not dismissing that. You know, but at the same time, you know, are there other ways to consider your work? And I just encourage people to think about different payment models, different business models. Uh, consider being business owners. There's a thing. You know, be that entrepreneurial spirit. That's what a lot of those people have going on. And it doesn't make it easy every day. But you know what? It's not easy every day either when you are watching for 18 months. Uh, CMS say we're getting ready to do this on October 1st, we're getting ready to do this on October 1st, we're getting ready to do this on October 1st, and it's completely out of your control. Okay? So, I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can, can think about the pluses or minuses of uh, things familiar um, and the pluses and minuses of things that might stretch you a bit to think a little differently on that. So that's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, ma'am. Um, what kind of resources uh, would you recommend? What kind of experiences do you think would help young practitioners, especially, emerge into these new areas and kind of just going off the beaten path a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, it's something I've always been interested in, but I know that since I am, um, I know that I'm naive, and I know that there's a lot left to learn, so I feel like it's sometimes tempting to just say, okay, put that on the back burner, come back to that, and you know, once, once this happens, once that happens, then life happens. Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. um, I think especially for like our first secondary students, so we're thinking about field work and all that, and you really want to kind of, you know, use that experience as a uh, trampoline into your, you know, entry level practice. Um, but I guess what what kind of resources or opportunities do you think would help build that professional competence and identity um, if you are going outside of the box? 
Mm -hmm. Well, some of it's sweat equity. I mean, there's a little bit of that in trying to figure out what's the place that you're interested in and passionate about and knowing that there might be uh, some learning that you're going to have to do that's outside of eight to five. So there's that um, part of, of reality. Um, you have a wonderful opportunity with the, the uh, work that you have going on here with, with Miranda and with your faculty um, to take advantage of that community classroom environment and be able to be in places where you really can take a population health lens or, or view and say, okay, we're working individually with these people and as a population, what are some other needs that we might be able to consider as well. Uh, and then that might give you an entree into other conversations in those settings that then can become, hey, there's this position, you know, and you might have a skill set that we need. So, you know, it's not, you know, the thing that I, I think in, in, in many things we have to be careful about, um, about assuming that it's like you, 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 you do go from here to there I mean, that's a big leap. I know from, I mean, I, I did my OT school. I went back and got a degree in public health. You know, that helped me know a lot about public health. That helps me, though, try to provide uh, information and be a liaison between, you know, people uh, and contexts um, so that everybody has a better understanding of that in some way. Um, I think it's going to be, though, identifying what you want to do. Don't give yourself, no, don't shortchange yourself on that I'm naive thing. There's a whole lot of people I know that are naive, and they are not in their 20s, okay? They've chosen uh, a different path, and that's fine. That is very fine, okay? And that doesn't make them naive either. That just means that they've gone a different way. Uh, but, you know, don't, don't dismiss the part where you're trying to figure it out as naive. That just means you're paying attention and you know that there's a gap here, so I'm going to have to identify that. I'm going to have to find a way to fill that knowledge gap or that experience gap or that, uh, that networking gap so that when I want to step into that place more fully, uh, I'm in a position to do that. Okay? And so. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much, Finley, Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> UFTV is your university and community TV station.